My parents and teachers have always encouraged me to be aware of how to be more environmentally friendly. I was taught to reduce, reuse, and recycle as a child. Having grown up in Europe, my family has been using reusable grocery bags for as long as I can remember. My generation has been introduced to a world where single-use plastic is thought of as an evil, damaging substance that is hurting our environment. This is an idea that has also been embedded in me by my years as a volunteer at the Monterey Bay Aquarium, where part of our mission is to educate the public about how plastics are negatively affecting our Earth. However, I am also aware that when disposable plastic was first introduced in the mid-1900s, it was revolutionary and changed what many people were able to do. Our grandparents lived without all of our modern disposable commodities, in a time when the economy was low and war was wreaking havoc. They grew up being taught not to waste, to mend things when they broke, and make do with what they had. But what prompted the change to these cheap, easy-to-use disposable goods that made throwaway living the new lifestyle? What led to the invention of plastic that is so common in today's world? And why is the plastic bag so popular? I think it's time to leave my 21st century conservation-oriented mindset behind and really figure out how plastic achieved such dominance. Plastic is a broad term encompassing many products familiar to us today. From the most common, polyethylene, used to make packaging and grocery bags, to polystyrene, nylon, and acrylic. Chemists in the 1800s experimented with developing new materials by manipulating natural materials. But the breakthrough we call plastic is made entirely of molecules not found in nature, a completely synthetic material. All plastics are made up of thousands of tiny building blocks called monomers, which all link together to form a chain called a polymer. The construction of these chains is what gives each type of plastic its unique properties. The arrangement determines the strength, elasticity, and flexibility of the plastic, which we refer to as its plasticity. The first fully synthetic polymer was Bakelite, cooked up by Leo Bakeland. The Bakelite Corporation boasted that they had created a new substance that could not be found in nature, transcending classic taxonomies and creating a fourth kingdom, whose boundaries are unlimited. The development of the chemical industry in the 1920s and 30s was complemented by the expansion of the petroleum industry. The waste products of oil refineries include ethylene gas, which was discovered by British chemists in the 1930s to build a building block making the polymer polyethylene. Other byproducts, including propylene and acrylonitrile, can be made into other commercial plastics. While today only 8% of our oil is consumed in the manufacturing of plastics, the economic benefits of using the waste product of one industry to support another pushed the development of the petrochemical industry. As World War II began, plastic was not in common use, but the demands of war changed that. In Britain, families gave up their metal fences and pans to the war effort for production of planes. The American military advocated substitution of plastics for aluminum, brass, and other strategic metals wherever possible. Polyethylene, nylon, acrylic, and styrofoam were all commercially used for the first time in the war. Manufacturing capabilities rose to meet wartime demands, so when the war was over, the plastic industry needed to look for new markets to direct the potential towards. An early plastics executive observed that in 1945, virtually nothing was made of plastic, and anything could be. When plastic was invented, it wasn't the answer to anyone's problems. No one needed plastic. There was no use for it. Everything was made out of naturally derived materials such as glass or fabric. Plastic was a solution for a problem that no one knew they had. But what people later realized, once plastic had been explored as a material, that it was a lightweight, resilient, and strong alternative to other materials, and it was cheap to produce. In 1955, Life magazine published an article glorifying disposable items, calling throwaway goods time-saving and liberating. The article featured a photo of the modern American family tossing disposable products carelessly into the air. Products such as the disposa pan, a single-use foil dish held in a steel frame. The foil dish was designed to be used only once, so it wouldn't have to be cleaned. People were no longer worried about saving money like they were in the Depression. Priority shifted from penny saved to time saved. Convenience was attractive. During the 1950s and 60s, women were moving into the workforce, and advertising for household products was often concentrated on liberating them from household tasks. While many of these products were not plastic, they certainly helped establish a society where single-use and disposable items were desirable. 
Plastics were being marketed as the panacea for modern living. House Beautiful magazine in 1947 referred to plastics as a way to a better, more carefree life. And in 1953, they went as far as to promise that people would have a greater chance to be yourself than any people in the history of civilization. But what about the plastic grocery bag? Where did that come from? And when did it take over from the paper grocery bag? For years, manufacturers, including Mobile Oil, worked on designs for plastic bags, hoping to overtake the popular paper bags. And they reached success in produce sections and as trash bags, but when it came to retail shopping bags, they just weren't taking off, because they were trying to recreate the square-bottomed stand-up paper bags that were so popular. It was a Swedish company that eventually figured it out. Sten Thulin took a flat tube of plastic film and found a way to cut and weld it to create a strong, sturdy bag. Thulin's drawings of the bag in the patent papers from 1965 resembled a sleeveless shirt, giving the bag its industry nickname, the T-shirt bag. When Mobile Oil caught wind of how well this invention was working, they wanted to bring it to the U.S., hoping to knock the paper bag off its perch. Made from high-density polyethylene, it was an engineering masterpiece, lightweight, waterproof, durable, and capable of carrying a thousand times its weight. In 1976, it was introduced in patriotic red, white, and blue in honor of the U.S. Bicentennial. Plastic bags were by no means an immediate success. One of the many issues that people had with them included hygiene concerns, because the checkout clerk at the supermarket would often lick his fingers to separate one bag from another. The weight that industry had promised they could take was no use if they were too heavy to carry, or if they fell over and spilled your purchases once you put them down. Safety was still an issue after a period of bag panic in 1959, where the filmy plastic bags used by dry cleaners caused the suffocation and death of almost 100 babies and toddlers, according to media reports. The industry started to change their production, making bags thicker and less clingy, but also started running ads about how to use and how not to use plastic bags. Plastic companies didn't only need advertisers, they needed lawyers, who fought to keep their market open against community campaigns to ban the plastic bag. The Society of Plastics Industry set about on a marketing campaign to ensure that there was not a mother, father, boy or girl in this country who does not know what a plastic bag is for and what it is not for. In 1962, when plastic bags were first appearing in our grocery stores, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, the book that is said to have launched the environmental movement. The first chapter, A Fable for Tomorrow, is a fictional account of an imaginary town that loses its beauty to pollution. Over 50 years later, has her story come true? Has the plastic bag become one of the most harmful things humans have put into the environment? Since Rachel Carson wrote her book, we've gone from not having plastic bags to using 500 billion every year worldwide. And the biggest problem is what happens to them after we've used them. In California, plastics rank second in our landfills. But plastic bags don't just sit still in landfills or garbage cans. They're so lightweight that a puff of wind can send them flying, creating urban tumbleweed, which travels freely until snagged by a tree, trapped on a roadside, or caught in water. Since 1997, Captain Charles Moore has devoted his life to surveying plastic debris in the ocean. Industry has tried to ignore him, but his message is too strong. He has trawled the ocean finding huge quantities of plastic debris, bottle caps, tiny pellets, and even plastic bags. The problem with all of these things is that plastic will never fully biodegrade, not in landfills and not in the ocean. They break down into smaller pieces, but will always be there. In the central North Pacific gyre, pieces of plastic outweigh surface zooplankton by a factor of six to one, and some places have recorded plastic outweighing zooplankton by as much as 45 to one. In the ocean, many animals mistake it as food. To an albatross, small floating plastic pieces look like schools of fish. To a turtle, a plastic bag looks like a jellyfish. And when these animals ingest plastic, their bodies can't process it. And with all the plastic that animals mistake for food, it's making its way into our food supply. Even the strongest environmentalist recognizes the advantages plastic has given us. Health and sanitation have been improved by lightweight equipment, sterile packaging, and rubber gloves to control contamination. Just look in your bag, your car, your bathroom, your kitchen. 
Plastic is integrated into our lives on so many levels. Only 25 years after the wide-scale introduction of the plastic bag, cities and countries have had to address what to do with the growing problems of disposal. As plastic bag waste has increased, bans have been introduced in more and more places. The first of these official bans was in 2002, when Bangladesh banned the plastic bag because they were clogging storm drains, intensifying monsoon flooding, and promoting deadly waterborne diseases. Since then, they have also been banned or had taxes added to them in China, many African countries, Spain, Ireland, Norway, and France. This movement has also been spreading in the U.S., with San Francisco being the first city to pass a plastic bag reduction ordinance in April 2007. Recyclable paper bags or compostable plastic bags are encouraged as alternatives in San Francisco's movement, along with reusable bags. Industry is waking up to the problems that need solving. And as the era of innovation plows onwards, new products are hitting the market at rates never before seen in history. As the bans of plastic bags and general negative attitude towards plastic disposable products increases, new types of plastic are being bioengineered using natural materials, making them biodegradable. More reusable alternatives are being offered. Water bottles made of thick plastic, metal, and glass, reusable fabric grocery bags, and bamboo utensils all easy alternatives to their single-use counterparts. Our grocery stores are actually encouraging us to use reusable bags, sometimes because of local laws, but also to avoid the negative publicity of having their plastic bags littering our neighborhoods. As early as 1997, grocery stores in France were selling reusable bags and restricting plastic use, without the need for law changes. The invention of polyethylene and its development into the ubiquitous plastic bag demonstrated the most inventive of human thinking. The creation of a material unknown in nature and molding and marketing it into an everyday product used worldwide. But with that breakthrough comes a need for human responsibility. The opening of the Pandora's box, an invention that cannot be undone, has consequences that may take years to emerge. The issue of disposal, ability to biodegrade, and question of need was not addressed when the invention first hit the market. We have a responsibility with any invention to consider not only the immediate benefit or breakthrough, but also to consider the implications of the whole lifespan of a material or product. In less than a generation, plastic bags have gone from being a miraculous new product to a major threat to our environmental health. As we learn more about how our disposable shopping bag impacts our environment, not only locally, but in places that should be untouched by human impact, we must address our role in undoing the damage. While industry, lawmakers, and retailers are determining a course of action, we need to hold them accountable and take personal action to prove that we are willing and ready to change.